Part 1 You will hear a radio announcer giving details of the evening's broadcast programmes. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. The time is 6.55 on Thursday, October the 15th. And now here is a brief review of this evening's programmes on Radio 6. Starting in just a few minutes, at 7 o'clock, we have the first programme in our new series, Animal Talk, a documentary with Laura Martins and Jeff Burns. And I'll be telling you some more about that in a minute. Then at 7.50 there will be a broadcast on behalf of the Rare Species Protection Group, telling you about some of the work they're doing to preserve endangered species. This will be followed at 8 o'clock by today's episode of Park Square, our drama series following the fortunes of a close-knit community in North London, in which Sunita begins to wonder if Carl has been telling her the truth, and Carl gets into trouble when a private email is read by the wrong person. At 8.30, we have our phone-in programme, What's Your View? Today's topic is the impact of the media, and you are invited to call in with your own views and questions on this topic. If you have a question for the panel, the number to call is 0207 815 422. This will be followed at 9 o'clock by news and weather, and then at the new time of 9.20, we have our Book of the Week, read by Graham Stanish. This week's book is a collection of Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories, which the author wrote for his children at the beginning of the 20th century and which are now enjoyed by children and adults alike. This evening's story, entitled How the First Letter Was Written, is an imaginary account of the events that led to the invention of writing involving a young girl called Taffy and a series of misunderstandings that arise when Taffy sends the first written message in the history of the world. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And now, some more information about our major new documentary series, Animal Talk, which explores the fascinating area of animal communication. Tonight's programme compares the communication systems used by two of the world's largest creatures, the killer whale and the elephant. Although these might seem like very different creatures, in fact, there are a lot of similarities between them. They're both mammals, they both live in groups, and the social bonds they form are extremely strong. For example, when a new elephant is born, the others in the group will all gather round to greet it. They also live for a long time, like humans, and their brains are very large, which means that there may be room for something in there that allows them to process some type of language. In the programme... Laura Martins, who has spent many years studying the communication systems of whales, describes how although whales do have very good sight, like humans they mostly use sound to communicate. In the case of whales, this is because this travels well in water, where visibility may be limited. In the programme, you'll hear underwater recordings of the whale calls, but what we don't know yet is whether the whales are talking to one another or whether the sounds are just to allow them to identify one another. Also speaking on the programme is Dr Jeff Burns, who has made a special study of elephant communication. 
Elephants use all their senses to communicate, but as Dr. Jeff Burns explains, one way we are only just beginning to find out about is what has been referred to as silent singing. Sounds produced by elephants which are too low for humans to hear, but can be heard by other elephants. And did you know that another way in which elephants can hear is with their feet? So, when one elephant stamps on the ground, maybe to warn about danger, the sound travels through the ground, and another elephant up to 30 kilometers away may pick it up. To find out more about exactly how they do this, stay tuned to Radio 6 for Animal Talk. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear somebody talking to a group of students about a university language center. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hi, I'm Katie Shaw and I work at the University Language Centre. Your tutor tells me you might be interested in using the centre, so I'm here at the college to explain a bit about it and, of course, to answer your questions. Where exactly is the centre? Is it near the college? It's actually on King's Road, just round the corner from here, in fact. Oh, I know it, yes. I wondered what that building was. Yes. What's there? Well... The library has about 4,000 books, pamphlets and transcripts to go with some of the 12,500 items on audio or video cassettes. These are at a wide range of levels of difficulty, covering language learning material in over 100 languages. There are also reference books without tapes, including dictionaries, grammars, grammar workbooks, vocabulary workbooks and model letters as well as texts on academic writing and effective study habits, etc. Audio cassette workrooms are on the first floor, by the way. Do they get any foreign language press there too? Yes. The library subscribes to a number of European daily and weekly newspapers, including Le Monde from France, L'Espresso from Italy, and the weekly international edition of the Spanish paper El País. What about learning with computers? Can you do that there? Call, or computer-aided language learning, is available on the first floor. Um, how many PCs are there? Counting both Macintosh and PC platforms, there are nine at present. There are materials in over 15 different languages and new material and language categories are being added as library funds permit. The programmes cover verb drills, uh, grammar exercises, activities to accompany multimedia textbooks, pronunciation, translation and some multimedia applications. The same hardware permits access to the internet with its many language learning and discussion sites. What about TV? That's a good way of learning a language too. Yes, definitely. We agree. So on the second floor of the centre, there are televisions to view live satellite television broadcasts in seven languages. Oh, which ones are they? Currently, we've got Arabic, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish and Russian. Turkish broadcasting can be viewed live on request. The centre records the news in French, German, Arabic, Italian, Japanese, Spanish and Russian. And English too. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20.
You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Sounds great. How do we sign up? To avoid paying a fee, you need to go to the centre with a valid university ID card or a letter from your college or departmental administrator on headed paper indicating your status, length of stay and language requirements. Are there any forms to fill in? I'm afraid so. Mm. You do that at the ground floor reception desk. Your registration is for one academic year only and needs to be renewed annually. You should tell the librarian who you are on your first visit and you will need to take part in an induction to the library service, including the proper operation of the centre's computers, televisions, videos and so on. Can she help us choose the right materials too? Yes. The librarian can give advice and assistance in locating material, making best use of the texts and tapes and so on. Let her know which language you want to study and what, if any, knowledge of it you already have. Also, say what reasons you have for learning the language. Your answers will help the librarian help you make the best choice of books and tapes for your needs. She can also offer you advice on how much time is needed to make progress in the language and can offer suggestions on how to improve your language learning techniques. Can she copy tapes for us to take home or can we borrow them? The library is a resource centre and reference library only. You can do as much self-study listening and reading work there as you want but it's not possible to take home materials, that's to say, books or cassettes. And copyright law doesn't permit the library or its staff to make copies of cassettes for use by students outside the centre. All material must be used on the premises, I'm afraid. This ensures the materials are always available for students working on their own and not out on loan for long periods, which could harm users' progress. So, if we can't take books home... Is it OK to photocopy them? The library staff will handle any photocopying, though international copyright law prohibits users from copying more than 5% of any one title in the academic year. You place a photocopy order with the librarian or an assistant and orders will be processed between 1 and 2 o'clock or after 5.30. How much does it cost? 10 pence per page. Payment is by photocopy card which you can buy from the information desk on the ground floor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a lecture about a place called Kuba PD. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good afternoon. Today, we're continuing this series of talks on the development of the Australian outback with a look at Cuba PD, the desert town of opal mines and underground living, which lies 860 kilometres north of Adelaide and 690 south of Alice Springs. The inaccessibility, harsh climate and almost total lack of water made it a highly unlikely place for human habitation. But that all started to change in 1915 with the discovery there of opals, the precious stones which seemed to change colour according to their surroundings. Settlements were established following the First World War when soldiers returning from the trenches of France brought with them the techniques of living below ground in dugouts. 
the depression of the 1920s and 30s, led to many prospectors leaving. But the town boomed again in the late 1940s, when shallow new opal fields were discovered, and immigrants from Europe arrived in large numbers after the Second World War. It must be remembered, though, just how hostile conditions were. Daytime summer temperatures reached well over 50 degrees centigrade, winter nights were bitterly cold, and dense dust storms regularly blanketed the town. To cope with this, more and more people began living in disused mines and purpose-built subterranean houses, where the temperature remains at a comfortable 25 degrees all year round, so that eventually around 70% of the town's inhabitants had made their homes beneath the surface. This led to the construction of hotels and even churches below ground, as well as an entire underground shopping centre, the only one in the world. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Perhaps not surprisingly, this has now led to the emergence of a secondary industry, tourism. Increasing numbers of visitors come to see the tunnels and the caves with their ventilation shafts, the weird machines lying about in the town, and just beyond it in the scorched red desert, the conical hills thrown up by the world's biggest opal mines. It's a logical stopping place for travellers too. The nearest town to Cooper Pedy is Woomera, in the prohibited area once used for launching space rockets. But even that is an enormous distance away. Within the town itself, there are plenty of hotel rooms and a number of ethnic restaurants. Remember that Cooper Pedy is one of the most multicultural places in Australia, with an estimated 45 nationalities represented, and its very own Opal Museum. A short distance from town, there's a section of the enormous barrier that runs thousands of kilometres across the country, the Dingo Fence, which is meant to keep these predatory wild dogs out of the sheep farming areas. Another attraction just outside town are the sets of various films made there, including Mad Max 3, as well as The Red Planet and Until the End of the World, names that reflect the harshness of the terrain and temperatures there. The name Cuba Pedy, incidentally, comes from an Aboriginal expression meaning white man's hole in the ground. Next, I'd like to go on to talk about Broken Hill, another mining town, but one that... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the following talk between two friends and answer the questions with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Do you know what, Tom? It won't be long before we'll all be travelling to space in a cable car. A cable car? 
What do you mean? A sort of sky lift? Well, yes, I suppose so. You must be joking. Where on earth did you get that idea from? Oh, I've just been reading it in a book called Apes to Astronauts by Adrian Berry. He's the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, so he should know what he's talking about. He says, wait a minute, I've got it here, page 28. A cable car to the heavens. Oh, honestly, Jane, you surely don't believe all that stuff you read in those sci-fi books? It's not science fiction. It's a fact. Hang on. I'll read you what he says. The space writer Arthur C. Clarke, to whose inspiration we owe the communications satellite, recently outlined a proposal for a new means of space travel, which, he admitted, is so outrageous that many of you may consider it not even science fiction, but pure fantasy. Shall I go on? No, just tell me how he thinks it could be done. Well, it sounds quite simple, really. One end of a cable, 23,000 miles long. How long? 23,000 miles. Do listen. One end of a cable, 23,000 miles long, would be attached to a point on the Earth's equator and the other to a satellite in geostationary orbit. So? The cable would be absolutely tight between the two points and the elevator would travel up and down, carrying people and freight. According to Arthur Clarke, it's the only way to travel in space without using rocket engines, which would make it much more economical. I wonder if it would be more comfortable. It sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, and heaven knows what speed it would be travelling at. Uh, what would happen if the cable broke? Oh, he explains all that. Apparently, the most likely place for it to break would be at or near the ground, and if that happened, it wouldn't fall down, it would fall upwards. Upwards? Hmm, yes, I suppose it would. Yes. Sounds funny, doesn't it? Something falling upwards. Anyway, it wouldn't matter too much either if the cable broke away from the high end. It would remain rigid until it could be reattached to the satellite. I don't quite see why. Well, it would be the pull of gravity from above. Anyway, who'd want to be stuck in an elevator attached to a rigid cable thousands of miles up in space? I suppose he doesn't say what would happen if it broke in the middle. Actually, he does. He says it would be dangerous if the break occurred at any altitude up to 15,000 miles because the bit attached to the Earth would... What does he say? Oh, yes. Collapse and wrap itself around the equator like a whiplash. Whiplash? You know, the long bit of cord or leather on a whip. Anyway... Even that would only be really catastrophic if the cable was made of steel or some other metal. Metals are much too heavy. The cable would have to be made of some material capable of suspension without snapping. But I thought you said the cable would be 23,000 miles long. I did, but the 3,000-mile breaking length is because of gravity. Well, all I can say is you'll never catch me going to space in a cable car. I'd rather keep my feet on the ground. Thank you very much. That is the end of part four.